So let's pick up with that first. And talk about our spinal reflexes. <clears throat> All right, so there's gonna be four common ones that we're gonna go over. We have the stretch reflex, the Golgi tendon reflex, the withdrawal reflex, and the cross extensor reflex. Our first two reflexes, the stretch and the Golgi tendon reflexes, are going to rely on proprioceptors. So now you get to actually see uh, proprioceptors in effect. So you've heard me talk about proprioceptors. Now you get to see how it works. So the specific proprioceptor for this first reflex, the stretch reflex, that we're going to discuss is called the muscle spindle. I'll show you a quick picture of that. Okay, here you can see our muscle spindle right here inside that muscle fiber there. And so that's going to be our proprioceptor. That little structure, and I'll describe it to you in a second, is going to be the structure that is going to uh, uh, monitor the amount of stretch that goes on in a muscle because, of course, you're probably thinking, all right, well, who cares? But if anybody that's known that's ever happened, this has ever happened to, if you stretch a muscle too much, you could damage the tissue. So we have these reflexes that will prevent you from damaging the tissue, or at least try to prevent you from damaging the tissue. So when we're dealing with the muscle spindle, there's a couple structures that you should be familiar with. We have what's known as intrafusal muscle fibers, and then our gamma motor neurons. And then of course, we have to have some sensory neurons wrapped up in there. So I'll show you kind of what we're, we're, we're discussing about, but I basically want you to think of, we have these muscle fibers, the intrafusal muscle fibers that have these sensory neurons just interlaced, just going through all the nooks and crannies here. <clears throat> and that's what we're seeing here. All right, so here we have our extrafusal muscle fibers. So those will be the muscle fibers that are on the outside. And then kind of internal to that, we have our intrafusal muscle fibers with this blue structure. And that's showing you all those sensory nerve endings that are just surrounding these muscle fibers. So these sensory nerve endings are gonna be monitoring the amount of stretch that's going on in that muscle there. And so, when we see this going on, when there's a stretch going on in the muscle, it's gonna stimulate the activation of these nerve fibers and they're gonna send sensory information to the spinal cord, which we'll talk about here in a second. All right, so that's what we see. As soon as some movement's going on or stretching of the muscle, it'll stimulate those receptors. They're gonna generate action potentials that are going to enter into the spinal cord. So let's get into the stretch reflex and talk about what happens here. All right. So say <clears throat> I'm trying to run by you and you stick your arm out to prevent me from running, but I keep running and you don't move. And now we're going to, I'm gonna use the triceps brachii muscle here, All right? The triceps brachii muscle is the muscle on the back of your arm. And so it's going to straighten your elbow. <clears throat> right, so, what happens when that muscle contract, or, or, or well, when it contracts, it's going to straighten the elbow. But when that muscle is, be, is being stretched, your elbow is flexing. So I'm trying to run past you, and you're trying to prevent me. And so what we see is, all right, that muscle starts to get stretched. And it stimulates the muscle spindle. And that muscle spindle is going to be firing off action potentials along that sensory axon. And it's gonna to travel to the spinal cord. What we'll see is inside the spinal cord there, that sensory axon is going to synapse on an alpha motor neuron. Now what's an alpha motor neuron? What's a gamma motor neuron? <clears throat> Basically, an alpha motor neuron is the largest type of motor neuron that there is. Gamma is gonna be smaller. So as you recall from chapter 12, all right, action potentials travel faster down bigger nerves. The larger the diameter of the nerve and if it's myelinated will help to increase the conduction of those action potentials. So our sensory axon will synapse onto a motor neuron and that motor neuron is then going to stimulate the same muscle that's being stretched because when it's being stretched, normally it's being lengthened. So we wanna contract that muscle to shorten it. 
prevent it from being damaged. So sensory neuron synapsing on the motor neuron only uses one synapse. So that's a monosynaptic reflex right there. So let's start off with that first part. And then we'll get into more of the specifics here in a moment. All right, so that triceps brachii muscle is getting stretched too much. And so that sensory neuron then sends that information into the spinal cord and it will then directly synapse onto our uh, alpha motor neuron and stimulate that alpha motor neuron to contract that same muscle here in the triceps brachii. Now, if you notice, there's a muscle group here on the other side of your arm. And those are the biceps brachii muscles. So these two muscles, as you know, have pretty much opposing actions. Whereas the uh, triceps brachii will straighten the arm, the biceps brachii will bend the arm. So, for this stretch reflex to really be all that it can be, we need to make sure that it is not inhibited by anything. And we sure as heck don't want the biceps brachii muscles to inhibit what's going on here. So we're gonna shut them off. So this is how we do it. <clears throat> that same sensory uh, neuron is going to synapse on an interneuron here in your spinal cord. That interneuron will then synapse onto an alpha motor neuron, but you'll see here, it's going to inhibit that alpha motor neuron that goes to the biceps brachii. And so we shut off the biceps brachii muscle so it doesn't interfere with the contraction of the triceps brachii. These muscles are known as antagonistic to one another. They oppose one another. So if we really want to get a good action here of the triceps brachii muscle, let's just shut this off and then we don't have to worry about it. So that's what happens here. And we call that reciprocal inhibition. So that same sensory axon, all right, or neuron, is going to then stimulate those the inner neurons that are going to inhibit the alpha motor neuron to the antagonistic muscle. In our example, it's the biceps brachii. And so we call that reciprocal inhibition. It's a very important all right, concept there because again, like I said, we don't want to work against our reflex. So we're going to shut off the antagonistic muscle group here so we don't interfere with the triceps brachii actions. All right, that's the stretch reflex. All right, the second type of spinal reflex is the tendon reflex, also known as the Golgi tendon reflex. So we just talked about what happens when a muscle is getting stretched too much. What happens to a muscle that contracts too much? We're gonna initiate this reflex here. So our proprioceptors for this reflex are called Golgi tendon organs. And so their job is to detect all right, if there's an increased amount of muscle tension going on. What causes that? Contraction, muscle contraction. All right, so the sensory nerve ending for these Golgi tendon organs are gonna be located near where the muscle and tendon kind of meet up with one another, the muscle tendon junction there. <clears throat> all right, so we're going to see now in this case, if the muscle's contracting too much, we're gonna shut that muscle off. So we're going to involve some interneurons here in the spinal cord. So we're going to see that sensory neuron is going to synapse on an interneuron. And then that interneuron is going to inhibit the alpha motor neuron that is gonna stimulate the muscle group, in this case, our agonist muscle group, and it causes that muscle group to relax. And when it relaxes and we shut it off, it prevents it from getting damaged. Now, there's a second part to this reflex. I'll show you that in a second. Here. Let's start off with the easy, easy part. So in this scenario here, all right, our quadriceps muscles right here are contracting too much. Right? So we need to shut them off. Jeez, there. 
All right. So our quadriceps muscle group here are excessively contracting. So the Golgi tendon organ, where you can see it, where it's located right here, where the muscle and the tendon meets up, right? It's monitoring the tension. It's saying, whoa, there's too much contraction going on. So that sensory information gets relayed here to the spinal cord. And what we'll see is, right, that sensory neuron is going to stimulate this inner neuron, which will, that inner neuron will inhibit the alpha motor neuron that's going to your quadriceps femoris group, right? And so it shuts it off. Well, that's halfway there, okay? We've shut off the muscle from contracting too much. All right, now we have to involve the antagonistic muscle group. And in this case, all right, that would be our hamstrings muscles. And we're going to activate them because when we activate the hamstrings, what are the quadriceps muscles will straighten the knee. And our hamstring muscle group will bend the knee. So in our example, the quadriceps muscle group were contracting too much and they straightened the knee out. So now we've just got done shutting them off and we're now we're going to flex the knee to lengthen this muscle out to make sure that we've decreased the tension there. So that involves the second part here. So that same sensory neuron is now going to excite some other interneurons, right? And those other interneurons are going to stimulate right, the alpha motor neuron to the antagonistic muscle group. In our example, it's the uh, hamstrings here. And so we call that reciprocal activation. In our previous reflex, in the stretch reflex, right, we shut off the antagonistic muscle group. So that was called reciprocal inhibition. In this case, we're gonna activate our antagonistic muscle group. And this is called reciprocal activation. So that's what we're seeing here. All right, here's our sensory neuron. It's gonna now stimulate and activate this inner neuron here. And that inner neuron will excite the alpha motor neuron that is traveling all the way to the antagonistic muscle here in the hamstrings, causing them to contract and bend the knee. And that reduces the tension in the quadriceps femoris. All right, that's our second spinal reflex. So let's finish up with the last two. The, the withdrawal reflex and the cross extensor reflex kind of, uh, um, uh, work in unison with one another, but I'm going to start off with the withdrawal reflex first here. And like it says here, the withdrawal reflex, you're going to withdraw, pull away either the upper extremity or the lower extremity, but normally you're going to pull it away from a painful stimulus. All right, so in this scenario, our receptor is going to be known as a nociceptor. Nociceptors are pain receptors. We'll learn about the different types of receptors in chapter 16 in more detail. But our pain receptors are nociceptor, and that's going to um, transmit that sensory input along our sensory neuron to the spinal cord. And so the spinal cord in this situation is going to utilize inner neurons. And those inner neurons for the withdrawal reflex are going to stimulate and excite the motor neurons to the flexor muscles. So if you're touching something painful with your finger, it's going to flex the biceps brachii. If you step on something painful with your foot, you're going to stimulate your hamstring muscles and your hip flexors. Any muscle group that has a flexor component, right, this will help to withdraw the limb from the painful stimulus here. We're at the same time now, okay, keep in mind, all right, we want to not inhibit the, the agonist muscle group. So we want to shut off any of the antagonistic muscles in that vicinity. So at the same time, when we're dealing with the withdrawal reflex, those inner neurons are going to inhibit the muscles of the extensors. So you can withdraw quicker because it's pointless to stimulate the flexor group and the extensor group at the same time. Nothing will happen. 
So let's start off here with the withdrawal reflex. We'll come back and do the cross extensor reflex here in a moment. All right, so here's our withdrawal reflex. So you got up in the middle of the night and you thought, I'm gonna go get a, a, a quick uh, bowl of ice cream and you forgot that someone in your house left the Legos out and you stepped on the Legos. And the, no, and the nociceptors in your foot picked up that information and they transmit that sensory information up to the spinal cord here. And what we see is that sensory neuron stimulates the activation of the inner neuron, which will activate your motor neuron to the flexor muscle group here in your leg, which are your hamstrings. That causes you to bend your knee and pull your foot away from the painful stimulus. Now, it's not shown here on this diagram, but at the same time, all right, some inner neurons are also going to activate, excuse me, um, some inner neurons are going to inhibit the motor neuron to the extensor group. And in this case, that would be the quadriceps muscles. So it's going to inhibit those muscles, right, by inhibiting the motor neuron to those muscles and shutting them off so the hamstrings can work without anything working against them. So that first one, or that first part is our withdrawal reflex. All right, the crossed extensor reflex works in conjunction with the, withdraw with the withdrawal reflex. This makes it, so when you pull away, all right, your limb, okay, from that painful stimulus, all right, the other limb, your weight-bearing limb, doesn't collapse. So it basically keeps your leg straight on the unaffected side. So you don't fall over, okay? I'll show you what I'm talking about here. All right, so here's the crossed extensor portion of our reflexes. So you'll notice that same scenario, the nociceptors pick up the painful stimulus, transmit that sensory information along the sensory neuron here into the spinal cord, okay? That sensory neuron synapses onto an inner neuron that actually decusates, crosses over the midline to the other side of the body, and it stimulates the motor neuron to the extensor muscle group on the opposite limb. So you've stepped on something painful with your right leg. Well, the crossed extensor reflex is going to make sure that your left leg that these muscle extensors here are contracting and keeping your knee straight. So you can bear the weight as you pull this leg away from the painful stimulus. And so you don't fall over and hurt yourself. So that's what we're seeing here with the crossed extensor. This is a contralateral reflex here. It's going to cross over to the opposite side of the body here. So it does so to support your body weight Right, because those extensor muscles are keeping your leg locked out and so that you don't fall over. So that's what we're looking at. Those are our spinal reflexes, right? The most, the, the four most common spinal reflexes. Um, and lastly, you've been to the doctor before and I'm sure you've, well, maybe you've never wondered why, um, why they're hitting you in the knee, all right, with a reflex hammer. Well, they're testing these reflexes that we just talked about are some of these reflexes here. And they wanna see, especially that stretch reflex, they want to see how well your nervous system is functioning. So we'll use reflexes as diagnostic tools. And so basically when we're dealing with these reflexes, we pretty much know which muscles are involved, which nerves are uh, playing a role in that, and where those nerves are going to have a role in the spinal uh, segments there of the spinal nerves. So there's two types of, of results when we're testing reflexes. You can have what's called a hypoactive reflex or a hyperactive reflex. So a hypoactive reflex is where there's no reflex or it's significantly diminished. And so when we see this, we're thinking, all right, this is because we're using the stretch reflex, there could be damage to the spinal cord, 
or at the neuromuscular junction where that motor neuron is going to synapse onto the muscle tissue or some sort of muscle disease. Maybe the muscles are degenerating or something's causing some sort of issue with their functionality. So when we see a hypoactive reflex, that's what we're thinking. Either something's going on at the spinal cord level or actually something with the effector itself, which is the muscle, or where the nervous system and the, and the muscle system meet up with one another at the neuromuscular junction. If we have a hyperactive reflex, so I go to tap your knee all right, with my reflex hammer and your leg shoots straight out, your knee goes straight, all right, that is going to be a very strong response, not used to that. So I'm going to think now that there's some sort of damage somewhere in the central nervous system, either in the brain, usually up where the upper motor neuron is going to be, or in the spinal cord. Because as you know, that upper motor neuron, all right, starts off in the brain, it travels down through the brain stem, and it travels down through the spinal cord before it synapses onto the lower motor neuron. So normally when we're seeing a hypoactive reflex, we're usually thinking, all right, something's wrong with the lower motor neuron. And when I see a hyperactive reflex, I'm thinking, all right, there's something wrong with the upper motor neuron. Well, where's the upper motor neuron? It's in the brain and in the spinal cord. So that's why we'll think there's damage to either one of those structures or both in, in, in the central nervous system. And we can have sometimes with these hyperactive reflexes, this clonus here. And that's kind of what I was telling you. When I tap the knee and the leg shoots out, all right, and your knee stays uh, extended and your, your, your leg starts to shake and quiver. It has these rhythmic oscillating movements here. And that's what we call clonus. And there's different types of clonus. But if we see clonus, we're, we're really thinking, all right, this is a hyperactive reflex. So I should really start to think there's an upper motor neuron lesion going on here somewhere. And that's probably going to be in the brain or spinal cord. All right, cool. Well, that completes chapter 14.